the way home, right? So. <laughs> well, I would like to tell this audience that the last time we were interviewed, which was it last September in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and the interviewer spoke to me first, and I thought I was being quite good in responding, and Dick was as far away from me as he is now. We both had mics, and all of a sudden, throughout this huge university, 1,500 people in the audience, and I was still talking, and he said, you know, when my wife started, I looked at my watch, and he said, now I'm looking at the calendar. <laughs> So he did over talk right now. <laughs> but, but I'd love to hear you reflect on nature or nurture. Your family, oh, my family. your environment. Well, I think I'm the luckiest person in this world, first of all, to have been born in New Waterford. Born in a mining town like I was, there was no such thing as a hierarchy in my life. It wasn't until I went away to school, first Mount Allison and then to McGill, <clears throat> and then uh, becoming involved in the corporate world, uh, it was a totally different thing. You know, the advantages of living in a small town where there was such a diverse group of people, you helped each other. You felt an internal responsibility to try to be of some help to people who were in your community. And the, my mother was, my father died when he was 34, left my mother with five children and pregnant. She had never worked in the store. He had, uh, she had come to Canada when she was 13 years old, born in 1900. And <clears throat> she had never worked in the store. She was busy having babies. And he had a brain aneurysm. I was about five years old, and uh, came into the house and said he was going to stretch out for a few minutes because he had a headache, and he'd go back to the store, but he never got up. And my mother took hold, like, when I think of it now, as a little girl, I didn't realize it, but she ended up, they blasted open the safe, I'm told this, in the store. She marched down to the tea and company, which was the biggest competitor in our town, walked over to a man by the name of Carmen Hughes and said, Mr. Hughes, how much are they paying you? And he said, I think 20, 20 or $22 a week. She said, we have a men's department. I'd like to hire you to come starting on Monday morning and I'll give you $5 more a week. And Mr. Hughes came and was part of our lives and he worked for her for 40 years. When he finished, she sent Mr. Hughes to England for a two-week holiday, but my mother never took a day off. She was never sick. She didn't believe in doctors. <laughs> Except, one. Except one. She loved him. She loved him. Um, yes, she did. Um, and so she put single-handedly six children through university and never looked as though she had done a day's work in her life. So w the work ethic was really instilled in us as children. And there was no hierarchy. You had maybe the biggest house in a small town, or you were the biggest fish in a small town. But next door to you were people who worked in the coal mine. Your friends were all from various groups. So I'm blessed to have grown up that way. Can I add a word about Cape Breton? <laughs> because uh, Ruth was rather afraid to bring me to Cape Breton in the first place. Because I figured thought, it would be the end of our, ma of our romance if he saw yeah, Cape Breton. She thought as a big city boy that this would have an adverse influence. Actually, I kind of fell in love with the place and worked there as a medical student for a couple of summers, which was perhaps one of the most important parts of my medical education. A, I had to learn an entirely new language uh, for various parts of the body and various infirmities, uh, particularly uh, where women were concerned because uh, they, when it came to gynecological problems, they referred to that under the general heading of inward trouble. <laughs> and for inward trouble, in those days, there was usually one procedure done, and that was what we called a DNC, a dilatation and curatage, but they referred to it rather directly as the scraping. <laughs> so, so I was told as a medical student frequently, Doc, I, I was to the Ostable for the scraping. 
But, but one lady uh, used the term in the past pluperfect. She said, I was to the ostable and got scroped. <laughs> I could go on, but I'll stop. You see why I wasn't worried about not preparing? No. Really. Um, but seriously, I, I do want to get, every now and then, I just want to pull back the humor. <laughs> there, seriously, yes. Seriously, the two of you are, without question, role models to all kinds of people, not only in Nova Scotia, but all over the world. And, uh, who are your role models? Oh, speechless they are. I'm trying to think. I think Mother, Ther Mother Teresa, to me, I read everything about this woman in India that I could ever read. And I thought of the work. These are the unsung heroes in our lives and the job that she did. Uh, we traveled through India quite a few years ago and were lucky enough to go and see Mr. Gandhi's home, which was a very simple home. And, but I, you bring this to mind right now, and I never forgot any part of it because it had such impact on me. But I can't. I have so many people I love, and many of them are sitting in this audience tonight that I know so well. I was hoping it would be strangers that they didn't, but I know. I told them they'd have to go to Morocco to find strangers. <laughs> uh, so maybe Dick, who's much better at this, will have a better answer for 